Hello and welcome to the first episode of Smart Attack. This will be the first upload for the new channel, so this video will be a test bed of sorts for me to see if the format will work, but I also wanted to make the video about something interesting as well, so we're going to take a look at nuclear reactors, specifically pressurized water reactors. There are many other types of reactors, like boiling water reactors, graphite moderated reactors, and molten sodium reactors, so hopefully this will be the first part of a series of videos on nuclear power plants. I have a special interest in nuclear power because I've grown up and lived within 20 miles of a nuclear power plant for over 20 years, where it has loomed ominously plotting its destruction and chaos. Except not. The Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant on the coast of California has sat diligently and silently providing power to about 3 million people since it was activated in 1985. Diablo and the San Onofre nuclear power plant were the last two remaining plants in California until San Onofre was permanently shut down in 2013, leaving Diablo as the last remaining nuclear power plant in California. And you probably wouldn't even know it was there unless someone told you. But what those people might tell you could be varied. There are a lot of opinions about nuclear power, and their use and discussion is a taboo to some people. So let's try to learn a bit more about just how one of these works. Time for some science! Nuclear reactors are all based on a single principle, nuclear fission. Fission is simply the splitting of a large atom into component pieces with a small part lost in mass, released as energy. The same process that causes the nuclear explosions that we are all too familiar with is what provides the electricity to run my computer right now, except on a much smaller, much more controlled scale. It's from this obvious relationship that nuclear power gets some of its bad connotation. Let's briefly look at how the fission process works, starting with the fuel. Nuclear power plants typically use either uranium-235 or plutonium-239 as fuel. These are both extremely large atoms, and uranium-235 is the only fissionable atom to exist in significant quantities naturally. The more common isotope, uranium-238, typically undergoes a process called enrichment used to convert the non-fissionable uranium-238 into the usable uranium-235. To be used as fuel, the uranium is typically enriched to a concentration of about 2 to 4 percent. This is concentrated much, much lower than the uranium used in weapons, which can commonly be enriched to over 90 percent. Now, when atoms of uranium-235 absorb a neutron, they split into component parts. The resulting atoms are not always the same, but a typical example would be uranium-235 plus a neutron, yielding krypton-92 and barium-141 as well as more neutrons, radiation, kinetic energy, and heat being released. If you add up the mass on both sides of the reaction, you see that some of the mass is lost and converted into energy. The famous E equals MC squared can show that the amount of energy released during fission is one million times greater than coal or petroleum products per unit mass. This reaction releases tremendous kinetic energy and radiation as well as additional neutrons. When these neutrons continue on to interact with more atoms of uranium-235, you say that we have a nuclear chain reaction. When the quantity of uranium-235 is high enough that this continues to happen, the uranium is said to be at critical mass and you have the basis for a nuclear weapon. When this reaction is controlled, you have a way to generate power. So how exactly do we control it? Well, you may have seen that the key to this reaction is neutrons. The nuclei of heavy atoms generally must absorb a neutron to decay, so if we can control the neutrons, we can control the fuel. So, the low-density uranium is made into small pellets, which are arranged into rods, and the rods joined into bundles. These bundles are then arranged in the reactor vessel with another set of rods known as control rods. The control rods are typically made of material like boron, silver, or indium, and have the desirable characteristic of being able to absorb neutrons without decaying. So as the control rods are lowered into and around the uranium, we can control how many neutrons are able to interact with the fuel. A simple and elegant brake pedal. The control rods are also held up out of the fuel by electromagnets, so if power is ever lost, the rods drop by gravity and shut down the reactor. Okay, so so far we have fuel, we have a reaction that generates energy, and we have a way to stop it from getting out of control. But that still doesn't explain where the electricity comes from. So let's look at the rest of the plant, which I like to think of as three loops. The reactor loop, the steam loop, and the condenser loop. First is the reactor loop, or primary loop. This is where we have the main reactor vessel with the fuel and control rods arranged as described before. This is the part of the plant that is fully enclosed by the containment building protected by concrete ranging from 3 to 10 feet thick. This loop is fully sealed and filled with water and is the only part of the plant that will have any of the radioactive fuel or coolant in it. Inside the reactor vessel, the nuclear reaction releases heat, raising the temperature of the water to about 600 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is kept in a liquid state by a pressurizer holding at about 150 atmospheres or above. 
Water is circulated by massive pumps, pumping the superheated water through to the next loop. Water is used in the primary loop for reasons other than because it is simply abundant. It also works as something called a neutron moderator. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, when the fission reaction occurs, very high energy neutrons are released. These neutrons are often too high energy to react with the only 2-3% uranium-235. Imagine if you rolled a marble at a bowling ball. The marble would have very little effect on the bowling ball, and the marble would be reflected off and continue on in a different path. But if you throw a marble at another marble, the speed of the thrown marble would be dramatically slowed and the second marble would absorb most of the energy. This is what is happening with our particles. Uranium-235 does very little to slow the fast moving neutrons, so a smaller object is needed, which the hydrogen in the water of our reactors does nicely. Once the neutrons slow down, they are free to do their fission business. So what does this mean for safety? Two things. As the water gets hotter and less dense, the moderation and absorption of neutrons will diminish, causing a reduction in fission rate and a decrease in temperature, making the system self-regulating. And if the worst were to happen, and there was a catastrophic leak in the primary loop, and all of the water was removed from the system, the fission reaction would cease and the reactor would shut down. Pretty cool. The steam loop, or secondary loop, is where we get our power generation. The primary loop is routed in pipes through a steam vessel, where its extremely hot pressurized water is surrounded by the water of the secondary loop, but kept contained to its own piping to prevent getting the radioactive water outside of the containment building. The 600 degree water from the reactor loop piping is simply used to make the water in the steam loop boil, generating steam and pressure. The steam is carried further down the loop into a chamber where it can expand and turn a turbine. This turbine is connected to a drive shaft leading to a generator which turns and creates electricity to be sent to the grid. The steam in the loop is then converted back into water in the condenser chamber. Which is where our third and final loop comes into play, the condenser or tertiary loop. The tertiary loop is simply massive pipes sucking water out of a large water source, piping it through the condenser to cool the steam loop, and then pumping it back out a couple degrees warmer. Diablo Canyon cycles about 2.5 billion gallons of ocean water through its cooling system each day. This is why it's advantageous to put these kind of reactors on the coast, as the ocean provides an inexhaustible supply of cool water. This kind of system is called a once-through cooling system, and has come under some scrutiny due to the fact that it raises the temperature of the water and then releases it into the ocean, causing some disruption of the ecosystem. So in the condenser loop, some nuclear power plants have the famous tall hyperboloid cooling towers that many people mistake for being the containment buildings. The cooling towers are in fact fairly simple, hollow structures that allow cool air to flow through the middle. The warm water from the condenser is sent up to the sides of the structure in small pipes, using materials of the building as a radiator to release heat. Then the water is sprayed from nozzles down the walls, letting it rain down into the collection basin below, where it is returned to its source. Pure steam is often seen billowing from the tops of these cooling towers. So there it is, our complete three-loop system with optional cooling tower. Really not that complicated once you know what's going on. Thank you for watching the first episode of Smart Attack. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below, and I'll see you next time.